In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to be enrolled, each to his own town. And Joseph too went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David that is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region living in the fields and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Christ and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, it's good to see you all here for our Midnight Mass celebration, which truly indeed is at midnight. But when we think about Christmas, we all know we have our various tasks to do. My favorite task always is setting up the manger scene, whether that's at my mom's home or at our rectory, or even this morning here in front of the altar. Have you ever wondered, though, where does it come from? Why do we do this? Where's the origin of this tradition? Well, I'll tell you a story. So take your minds back, back 790 years to the year 1223, to a little town of Greccio. St. Francis of Assisi had gone there to celebrate Christmas. Greccio is about 50 miles northeast of Rome, it's in the province of Umbria, in the Riete Valley, and it's an ancient town. It's right there at the edge of the Apennine Mountains. This town goes back to the earliest days of the Roman Empire, and therefore not only was it an ancient town, but also, with Christianity, a town of ancient faith. The people there were farmers and also they were winemakers, so they had terraced the hills to have these beautiful vineyards and so on. Eventually, St. Francis of Assisi and his friars had established a little monastery way atop the hill, 2,000 feet above sea level. So St. Francis had gone there to this little town of Greccio to celebrate Christmas. He realized that their little monastery chapel would not be able to hold the whole townspeople for midnight mass. So he and his friars decided they would do something special, and that was to have mass outside in the piazza in front of the little monastery. It was a clear evening, so the stars would be bright and twinkling and so on. So they started setting up the altar. But Francis wanted to do something special because he loved Christmas. His biographer, his first biographer, Thomas of Chilano said, more than any other feast, St. Francis celebrated Christmas with an indescribable joy. He said that this was the feast of feasts, for on this day God became a little child and nursed like all human children. Francis embraced with great tenderness and devotion the pictures of the child Jesus and stammered words of tenderness 
full of compassion in the way children do. So Francis decided there has to be something special to do this evening. So he knew that there was this little niche in the side of the mountain right across from the piazza. So he decided, let's make a nativity scene, recreate the gospel passage. So he took the statue of Mary and Joseph from the chapel, put them there, gathered some hay, put that around the place, borrowed a little baby doll from a child, a little wooden baby doll, put that in a little manger crib. Then he borrowed some sheep, an ox, a donkey from a farmer, and he had it all set up. Well, midnight mass came. So Francis was the deacon, so he was entrusted with proclaiming the gospel, the same gospel that we just heard, that tells us about the birth of our Savior. Right after the gospel, the friars started chanting a meditation song, Puer Natus, the child is born. So with that, Francis paused, and he was just moved like a little child to go over to this nativity scene. He knelt down, he gazed at this little baby doll, but people said there was this very miraculous kind of glow that occurred. All of a sudden, the little baby doll became alive. And Francis picked up that live little baby, the baby Jesus, and held Jesus in his arms. All this was attested to. But imagine that, St. Francis actually holding the baby Jesus. Imagine gazing into the eyes of baby Jesus. And what did St. Francis see? Well, he saw the love of God incarnate. He saw the face of God, but he also was able to penetrate into a great mystery, a mystery that we celebrate at this Christmas time. For in gazing into those little eyes of a baby Jesus, he saw the eyes of God, and that took him back to the very beginning, to the Genesis, when the Father spoke his word and said, let there be light. And creation started unfolding. And eventually creation climaxed with us, made in God's image and likeness. And yet we know, despite that, man sinned. Our parents, Adam and Eve, sinned. They wanted to be God. They wanted to do God's will. Instead of living in peace, sin entered this world, and the relationship with God was ruptured. Yes, God still loved them. Yes, God made a covenant, but they oftentimes forgot that covenant. God gave them the commandments, and yet they broke the commandments. God sent the prophets, but they rejected the prophets. So finally, God would send his son. So the father would send his son, Jesus, the word, into this world. He would send his son, who is consubstantial with him, second person of the Trinity. And so Jesus entered this world through Mary, the virgin, free of all sin, even original sin, full of grace, who had conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through her, Jesus, true God became also true man. And here we find a paradox. And Francis knew this because in the Old Testament prophecies of Isaiah, we hear these titles for the Messiah. Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Prince of Peace, Father Forever. And yet, while those titles would seem very intimidating for any of us to think that the Messiah like that is coming, he came like a child, like us. And Francis embraced that child. But Francis knew that the love doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with this birth of Jesus. No, Francis knew why he came. The love of God has been poured out because this child came to reconcile us to the Heavenly Father. Yes, the child came to heal this chasm that had been caused by sin a chasm 
that would take a divine action of God to heal, but because human beings committed the sins, it would take also a human action. So Christ, only Christ, true God who became true man, could possibly offer the sacrifice to free us from sin. So Francis pondered this great mystery, this gift that is of Christmas, not just the birth of a child, but really our reconciliation to Almighty God. So my brothers and sisters, you and I need to be mindful every time we look at our nice little beautiful nativity scene here. We look, it up, look up and we see Christ on the cross because that's why he came. He came to take on our burden of sins, to offer a sacrifice that transcends time. He came to die for your sins, my sins, the sins of all time. And he did not just die, he rose to give us the hope of everlasting life. Put it all together, there's the gift of Christmas. This is what Christmas is about. It's the gift of God's love that has been made incarnate in our Savior. And so, my brothers and sisters, St. Francis, gazing for just a short time, pondered this great mystery. Yes, he held that little baby Jesus in his arms. But didn't he also, in his heart, hold that crucified Jesus? Yes. Now, Francis eventually would put the little baby doll, or put the baby Jesus back in the crib, and then became a baby doll again. But all the people knew that a miracle had happened. And yes, even off in the distance they could hear, like the voices of angels saying once again, glory to God in the highest. Thomas of Chilano again writes a little account of this. And he said that up to that time, the child Jesus had in fact been lying in a slumber of forgetfulness in so many hearts. Through his servant Francis, the remembrance of this child was awakened and indelibly imprinted on man's memory. So my brothers and sisters, what about us this Christmas? Wouldn't it be wonderful if at this Mass we could actually hold baby Jesus? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, we can in a different way because we're here at Mass, Christ's Mass, Christmas. Every Mass is really a Christmas. Christ is made present through this living Word of God, the Holy Gospel that we've just heard. He's present in the teachings of our church, that truth that he revealed, the truth that has been carried on to this day. But now, in just a few moments, we offer a sacrifice. We offer bread and wine as our Lord told us to. And by the will of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the priesthood of Christ entrusted to his priests, that bread and wine is transubstantiated into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Christ becomes present, truly present. He offers to share his life with us. And again, it's very paradoxical because he comes in simple forms, the form of bread and wine, transubstantiated into his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So yes, being in a state of grace, we can hold little baby Jesus, but also the crucified, glorified Jesus in our very souls. What a tremendous gift. But my brothers and sisters, while we think of this gift that has been given to us by Almighty God, we can't hold on to it selfishly. Or we can't just put it on a shelf or in a closet and wait to bring it out next year. This is a gift to be lived. This is a gift to be shared with others. And that's what we have to do. Because if we're going to receive this gift truly this evening, then we have to be willing to share it. So how are we going to do that? Well, again, looking at our little manger scene, we could say, we should be faithful, just like Mary, just like Joseph. We should be faithful as they were. But that could be a little intimidating too, because after all, we're poor, frail human beings. But maybe there's another clue that Francis gave us in the nativity scene, and that's in the animals. 
The gospel doesn't mention any particular animals, but there are animals that he chose. So think of that ox. Well, the ox was a very priceless animal in the Torah. The ox was the priestly sacrifice. Shouldn't our devotion then be one of a priestly sacrifice? Through our baptism, we share in the priesthood of Christ. So if we really love Christmas and we want to embrace Christ, then that means each day of our lives, we should take time for prayer, to be with our Lord, to adore him, to express sorrow for our sins, to give thanks for what God has given to us, to offer our own intentions, praying for our family members especially. Think how important that is. If we really want to be with our Lord and share that gift with others, pray for your family members, especially those that may have gone astray, maybe those that don't practice the faith anymore. Pray for them. That's how we can share Christmas. Or think of all the persecuted Christians in our world today, Christians living in Syria, Egypt, other places. Think of what their Christmas must be like. We should be praying for them. That's part of how we share the gift of Christmas. But then, too, there's the sheep. And yes, we would think that with shepherds come sheep. But the sheep have an importance. After all, Christ is the good shepherd. We're part of a flock called a church. So part of our gift of Christmas, making it known and sharing it, is being a good member of the church. This is part of our family, where we live our faith where we celebrate our faith in Jesus Christ. But also, the lamb of sacrifice is Christ, the lamb of God, the new Passover lamb. Are you ready to make a sacrifice? If we really want to embrace Christ, should we not embrace his witness of sacrifice? Jesus said to us that he sends us out like lambs among wolves. So yes, it's not easy being a Christian in our world today. But that's what we're called to be, a real witness. And witness means martyr. Same word. And are we prepared to give such witness? That's the gift of Christmas. Or think about then the donkey. Well, the donkey, of course, was the beast of burden. Carried Mary to Bethlehem. Carried Jesus when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday the beast of burdens. Well, if we really embrace Christ at Christmas, isn't part of our sharing Christ with others taking on the burden of our fellow man? Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of your brothers, that's what you do unto me. When you feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty and clothe the naked, visit the sick and the imprisoned, yes, that's when you do it for me. Do we share in the burdens of our fellow man? I think of the beautiful story that Mother Teresa told to my dear friend Bishop Curlin. She said that one Christmas Eve, she and her sisters were out in the streets of Calcutta, and they found this man, a Hindu man, who was dying in the gutter. He had sores, even like maggots in his sores. They took him into their home, and they bathed him. They cleaned out all those wounds. They put him in a clean bed. They fed him like a little baby. And the man said, I was a worthless nothing, and now I'm going to die like an angel. And the man said, if this is the Jesus you believe in, I want to believe too. And that Christmas Eve, that Hindu man was baptized. That's sharing the gift of Christmas. So my brothers and sisters, Yes, we're here for Christmas to receive a great gift. Take it to heart, cherish it, but be ready to share it with others. And so we can conclude with that simple prayer that St. Francis wrote. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, unity. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is error, truth where there is despair, hope, where there is sadness, joy, where there is darkness, light. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood 
as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May God bless you.